Everybody could make their way to their seats. We will get our marriage conference started. Welcome to Saving Grace Bible Church and our marriage conference. I know that many of you are regular attenders. We also have several guests uh, visiting with us, and we are thrilled that you have joined us for this conference. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Eric Borkstrom, the pastor of Family Ministries here, and over the course of the conference, you'll get to know me as the announcement guy. So with that in mind, let's talk about some, some announcements. Let me inform you some things to keep in mind during the conference. First of all, you probably noticed we are a church that is serious about our coffee. And we do allow coffee in the sanctuary. Now, we do ask that you put a lid on the coffee and that you remove the cups after each, each session, but we do want you to enjoy coffee during the conference. And because you'll be drinking lots of coffee, you'll probably want to know where the bathrooms are if you don't. So bathrooms located right back in the foyer there to my right, also in the office center in the middle of the hallway, right where you uh, dropped off your kids, registered your kids for the child care. And there's bathrooms located there as well. And also, everyone should have received a booklet when they checked in for the conference. You have a little Q&A card in the booklet. Uh, certainly uh, fill that out and drop that in the Q&A box at the registration table. And try to do that by noon tomorrow. And Pastor Jerry and, uh, and Pastor Mark will be doing a Q&A in the final session tomorrow. So, that, so we anticipate a great time with that. An announcement particular to tonight. Following the session tonight, we have a cookie fellowship. I will give instructions about how to get there uh, immediately following this session. And lastly, I thought I would mention maybe we could resolve to all avoid marriage conference elbows this conference. A you know, few, la few people laughing, you know what that is. The marriage conference elbow is when you're sitting next to your spouse and you're hearing something that you think they really need to listen to, <laughs> and you give them a little jab, a little elbow. Now, if they're sleeping, the elbow's appropriate. Go for it. If they're not sleeping, I would, I would advise not doing it. You wouldn't want them to do that to you. And you ever notice when you, when you give them that elbow, you expose them in front of everybody? Now everyone else knows what they're struggling with. So let's avoid marriage conference elbows for this, for this conference. Well, with those uh, items aside, it is my delight to introduce to you our speaker for the conference this year. He's certainly no stranger to our ministry or the fraternal of ministries that we are in. Uh, he really doesn't need an introduction, but we'll give him a brief one anyway. Jerry Ragg has served as senior pastor at Grace Emanuel Bible Church in Jupiter, Florida since 2001. He serves as board chairman and a faculty member of the Expositor Seminary in Jupiter, as a graduate of the Master's Seminary. He and his wife, Louise, have been married 38 years, uh, four grown children, many grandchildren, uh, much more than the, uh, your booklet says. They, they keep adding, so the booklet can't even keep up with it. Uh, if you're a part of our church, you probably already know that Jerry's had a significant impact on the members, several members of the pastoral staff here. Uh, I believe we would all say that no one's had a greater influence on us in, in how we think about the truth, the Christian life, and ministry than, than Jerry. Uh, I think of him as a man of unwavering conviction and leadership that compels others to follow. Uh, I've always marveled at the depth of wisdom and insight that he has uh, when thinking through the truth and proclaiming the truth. So I know we are going to be well served. Thank you, brother, for coming out and serving us this weekend. Uh, right now I'm going to pray for our conference, and then we're going to sing a few songs before Jerry comes and ministers to us. So let's stand together. Father, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity to narrow our study in your word to the topic of marriage. We thank you for Pastor Jerry and Louise for their willingness to come and minister to us this weekend. We ask that you would sustain Jerry's voice, that you would give him clarity in teaching. You would use him to build up and edify your people. We know that marriages in all kinds of conditions are represented here tonight. Marriages that are strong and healthy, where Christ is exalted. Marriages that are plagued by shallowness, just limping along with partial obedience. Marriages where one or both spouses are discouraged, struggling to respond to the truth because of the burdens of life. And perhaps there are some marriages here on the brink of ruin, threatened with divorce, where a spouse is living in, in unrepentance. Lord, no matter where where everyone is on that spectrum, we pray for these precious couples. 
We ask that you would encourage those who are striving in faith and obedience, that you give clarity to those who are confused and lacking understanding. You would give grace and strength to the weak and faint-hearted, that they might be renewed in the pursuit of godliness, that you would soften the hearts of the unrepentant who stubbornly persist in sin. Show them their pride. Give them the gifts of repentance and faith. These are but a few of our needs. Lord, you know all of them. We are utterly dependent on you to accomplish anything this weekend. So we ask that in your kindness, you would be pleased to invade our hearts with your grace so that we will want to yield our wills and complete obedience to Christ. For his sake, we ask these things. Amen. Oh, thank you so much to the team that is leading us in song for the conference. I love it. Thank you so much. Especially that last song, which has become a really popular one in evangelical circles, thankfully so. The lyrics are tremendous. What a powerful message in song. And uh, it's become one of our favorites so much. Well, good evening and uh, welcome to the Marriage Conference at Saving Grace Bible and from all the other ministries that you represent, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We greet you from Grace Emanuel Bible Church, and uh, there are some folks even from our ministry who came over for the conference, and uh, we're thrilled that you took the time to come over here and to be a part of this. Marriage conferences are unique things because uh, sometimes we are coming to them and we're in a springtime, really, of of life in our marriages, and uh, at other times we, we come to the Lord and to some instruction on marriage, and we're, it's not been so much of a springtime. It's been uh, wearying, and we just finished singing that uh, it is the Lord alone that can take us out of our weary season. It's also the Lord alone who gives us perspective on those great springtimes of life in our marriage and companionship. It helps us keep perspective. And, and in some ways, as I begin the conference tonight, I really just want to set forth some proper ways of thinking about the truth, thinking about marriage, and, and sort of give us a foundation for all that we're going to talk about in our sessions this weekend. Marriage, of course, is a great gift. First Peter 3 says that it is the grace of life. When Peter says in First Peter 3, 7 that he... He wants husbands to understand their wives and live with them in that way. It is, it is because marriage is called the grace of life. Why does Peter call marriage the grace of life? Well, first of all, we know that God not only designed the institution of marriage, but He designed it to be the rule, not the exception. The exception is that God gives grace to some who will not be married and gives special grace to those who've been married and lose their spouse and are now alone. There's all kinds of scenarios for which God dispenses a unique grace. But marriage itself, designed by God, was for the purpose, of course, of the growth and expansion of all that He had created. And, of course, the people that He'd created were to be fruitful and multiply. Marriage is the rule, not the exception. Uh, Singleness is a great gift for which God gives special grace, but so is marriage. And so... It's a wonderful recalibration for us all the time to realize that, that this is called the grace of life for a reason. God designed it to be so. It's a common grace as well as for believers, a special grace. Sometimes people will ask me, can unbelievers have a great marriage? Well, if they live in light of the common grace of God and be faithful to the institution He designed, they can have as good a companionship experience as an unbeliever can have apart from the grace of Christ. It will, of course, be ultimately unfulfilling and will have all kinds of powerlessness show up in their life and marriage. It would be tragic if they died in their sin and had a wonderful experience of the common grace and ended up in hell and judgment. But nonetheless, God designed it to be like rain on the just and the unjust in the common grace of God. Believers, believers experience something completely unique. We understand that it is designed by God for the reasons it's designed by God. We understand it because our mind has been renewed by the Spirit. But more than that, we also understand what plagues this grace of life. 
we understand the problems that come into it. And of course, I, I'm not nearly the expert that some of you are. Uh, if, if I could be ever called in a moment something like someone who knew what they were doing in marriage, 38 years is all my wife and I have under our belt, and we are learning constantly the things we yet need to make this uh, a Christ-honoring relationship. Nonetheless, for believers, we know what the cali- recalibration means. We know it's essential. And so we open up the conference sort of recalibrating our minds a little bit on some important things. Take your Bibles for a moment and look with me at Hebrews 12. We'll jump around a little bit tonight. I know that your session manual might say something about jumping into the subject of husbands tonight, and I'll introduce that at the end, Lord willing, if we can move through some of these introductory ideas that we need to talk about. But at least for our purposes in the opening here, I wanted to make some introductory comments that help us with the conference, that help us with this essential recalibration. Hebrews 12, you remember, says that we are to be about some proactive things in our Christian life, the first of which is to lay aside encumbrances and excess baggage. He says that in Hebrews 12, verse 1. And the entangling sin, the sin which easily entangles us, we're to lay aside those things, and we are to be about the running of a race, and we're to do it with endurance. It is a race set before us, the race of the Christian life. Uh, Your marriage isn't really the issue then. Your Christian life is the issue. Your walk with Christ is the issue. Uh, And so everything, every relationship, everything that God gives us to do, not just in marriage but in life, is is originating here in whether or not you're running this race as Christ intended. And here it is to be pre... uh, it it is to be um, prepared by the laying aside of every encumbrance and sin which easily entangles us. Nonetheless, you are in a race, and it is to be run with endurance. Therefore, verse 2 says, here is your, your primary recalibration. Your eyes are to be by faith on our Savior. He's the only one that makes marriage make sense. He's the only one that recalibrates everything we do in marriage. And to fix our eyes on Him, we know then that He is, as it says here, the one who authored our faith. We just sang that we can't cause our soul to live. That's right, in the sovereign purposes of God, He has in eternity past fixed His love on His redeemed, and in history, human history, He grants you faith and repentance. He brings you to see the loveliness of the Savior. He convicts you of sin. So He is the author of our faith, and therefore, He is the only one who can grow it and perfect it. And so the first thing that I wanted to say tonight was that as we think about a marriage conference and sort of bringing into our lives a a remembrance of principles we already know and perhaps a, a forging of new principles we have not learned, we must begin here. That our, our marriage is part of this race we run with endurance. That is where it begins. Marriage, therefore, is an adventure, an adventure of a lifetime. It is a walk with Christ. It isn't merely trying to be happy in your in your life as partners, as a couple. It isn't merely to to finish successfully and be a a model or looked up to by other people. It isn't to keep um, some sort of euphoric and utopian peace throughout your married life. If you're here tonight and you thought, man, we just want to learn how to get rid of the tension, uh, we hope to sort of recalibrate your thinking on some of that. There's a realistic way to look at the race that we run with endurance, and we have to begin there. I realize that uh, you could go to dozens and dozens of marriage conferences, and you could listen to all kinds of seminars and principles, but if we don't begin here, we, we sometimes become fixated on uh, practical outward things, none of which are perhaps bad, 
particularly biblical mandates, but without a foundation, they, they lack faith. They lack a strengthening faith, a growing and robust faith. Here you have this way of describing faith as a fixing of your eyes on Jesus who authored it and is the only one then that can grow it. So marriage in so many ways has to be viewed in the macro before we get down to the practical level. It is Christ who then called us to run a race in our marriage with endurance. It is a fixing of our eyes in faith on Him. He's the one who began our walk with Him and He's the perfecter of it. It involves laying aside excess baggage. That is to say, the things that have to go that encumber this race, the things that drag us down and, and don't allow us to run with endurance, and we are to lay aside sin. We're to strive to lay aside sin. Sometimes in our church, we, we just want to uh, recover the ground that we need to recover when we're thinking about this whole matter of the Christian life. There seems to be this mantra today that imagines that you can live at some, at some level of happy gladness and emotions in some constant state that's going to somehow take you to some other plane and you're never going to have to live in the trenches of battling sin. And if you do, maybe a weekend here or a weekend there, and if you do battle sin, it's probably a sign that you're really not a great Christian. All that's got to go away. This is a race. It is to be run with endurance. It involves battling sin and laying aside excess baggage. It's going to mean learning endurance. And Christ is the object out in front of us. He is the author of this thing and the perfecter of it. And of course, he'll go on to say that if you think that you have yet battled at the level that you, you can and that you will be strengthened to battle, then you have not understood what the Christian life is. In fact, notice what he says. Uh, Consider him, verse 3, who's endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Lose heart is that New Testament term which literally uh, has to do with conviction. So you don't lose your conviction in the weariness of this uh, enduring of hostility against uh, this, in, in this battle against sin. And verse 4, you haven't resisted to the point of shedding blood yet. Of course, I haven't been martyred. I haven't shed my blood unto death for the sake of the gospel. I'm still striving against sin in this life. So ultimately, I have to realize I haven't gone as far as I can go. I have not experienced so much of what God has for me just yet. I, I, I cannot imagine some plane I'm going to get on and it's just going to be tension free, happy, glad, everything, and, and all conflict gone except for a few skirmishes here and there. That, that is not how we're to view the Christian life. The Christian life is the work of Christ to grow our faith, to make us more like Him, and marriage is in the work of marriage, it's sort of the byproduct of all that's happening as you fix your eyes on Christ and set aside those things that slow you down in the race. That's foundational when we think about anything in our lives, let alone marriage. And I, I wanted to begin there so that we don't start at the wrong place. Jumping into the role of husband, jumping into the role of a wife, jumping into what we're going to talk about in terms of resolving conflict can go nowhere if we do not start there. How many ever years you've been married, if you're a veteran of many decades or you have really been in the zero to five years of the beginning of it, either way, your marriage isn't to be the ultimate focus. A marriage conference, therefore, is to be more really about your theological understanding and the growth of your faith. It's interesting that couples get into seasons of great struggle and they think the whole thing has fallen apart. Not if you have Christ and not if you have His Word. We tell our church all the time, sinners have to stick together. We stick together because we, we get alongside one another. We help one another. And seasons of tension, particularly if they last a long time in marriage, it's discouraging. 
And yet even discouragement drives you to Christ and drives you to the Scripture and drives you to one another and drives you to the right things. God uses pressure, as Hebrews 12 goes on to say, the discipline of the Lord. He uses pressure to increase your virtue. And and many times couples get into seasons of grave difficulty and they begin to look for a relief valve rather than a transformation path. We are not to look for a relief valve. We are to understand what is at stake and what God is doing. We need a recalibration. Books and materials that try to help people in their marriage focus largely on cheesy little things and, you know, rekindling the flame weekends and more date nights together and choosing a common hobby or, or 50-50% oriented agreements and uh, doing ministry together or accountability partners and on and on the practical tips go. And I'm not here to say whether any of those in a particular or given context is, has merit or not. These things though, though none of them inherently unhelpful perhaps, they really do not make for a strong marriage. My wife and I have always said what makes a good Christian marriage is two good Christians, two striving sinners who are calibrated properly on what this is all about. In his book, What Did You Expect? Paul Tripp said, knowing that you're living between the already and the not yet tells you where you are located in God's story of redemption. That's right. Glory is coming. Rest is coming. Aren't you glad? Ladies, sanctification in full for your husband is coming. What a great... You ought to be smiling all the way because you're on your way to glory in Christ. We're on our way to glory in Christ and, and that time is coming. There will be no more sin. Can you imagine it? No, we can't imagine it. We can read about it. We can believe it. We can trust the promises of it. But we live with the taste of sin in our mouth right here. And so the words of, of that uh, chapter by Paul Tripp are excellent. You're located in God's story of redemption between the already, that is to say you're in Christ and you're redeemed, you cannot be lost, and the not yet, the the thing that is coming for which we eagerly wait. Redemption, full redemption. Tripp goes on to say, already God has sent His Son to live, die, and rise again for our salvation. Already He's given us His Spirit to live within us, but the world has not yet been restored. Sin has not yet been completely eradicated. We've not yet been formed in the perfect likeness of Jesus. That's right. Suffering, sadness, and death are not yet no more. It's it's hard to live in the middle, but that's where we live. We live in a world that's still sadly and terribly broken. Your marriage will not escape its brokenness. That's right. To whatever degree we have grown in Christ... We already know that sin is our greatest problem, not our spouse, sin. Sure, our spouse sins. Sure, it is a difficult struggle. Sure, it affects our lives, but that isn't our greatest problem. Sin itself is our greatest problem. And we already know that the Bible is God's revelation to the sinner as to what our problem is, and to who our solution is, and how we can be rescued from our problem. You open the scriptures anywhere. You randomly plunge your finger toward the page, and you will find yourself reading about sin, about sinners, about how God deals with sin, and about the answer to the sin problem, about our Savior from sin, and about the various redeemed sinners from sin's power, or the glorious future which totally frees us from sin. Anywhere in the Bible, that's what you're going to be looking at. But it's, it's common for believers to approach marriage with some sort of expectation for some kind of relational Disneyland where everyday married life is the happiest place on earth. And so we become discouraged and frustrated. And the only reason we're doing that is because we have, we have lost sight of why God gives us this wonderful grace of life. He gives it to us to make us more like His Son. Therefore, marriage is God's 
sneaky way of getting you and I crucified. Isn't that great? We've somehow, in our evangelical culture, become convinced that life together, you know, already begins with the ingredients for deep, romantic, and lasting friendship. And if we simply go to a weekend and spice it up once in a while with, with some of those things or, or do some cheesy sort of practical thing that adds interest to our life, if we divvy up the household chores, if we find good schools for the children, and then those early uh, goosebumps of our dating relationship can be sort of rekindled now and again, that somehow we'll remain strong. But here's the problem. We don't come into marriage experienced and relationally skilled in our battle with sin. We enter marriage broken. Another great little paragraph by Paul Tripp in that book said this, we live with flawed people. Your marriage will not be protected from those flaws. When you start unpacking what life is really like between the already and the not yet, you gain perspectives that are enormously helpful for understanding things you need to face if you want a marriage that is wholesome and healthy in the eyes of God. That's absolutely right. So rather than have false expectations... We need to have right expectations. I want to give you a few of them tonight just as we open up the conference. I want to give you some expectations that you ought to embrace every day. If you really want to sort of think about this uh, with some altitude and then uh, before we sort of dive down into some of the particulars uh, of the landscape, then, then you ought to build your thinking about marriage on some particular expectations. So rather than expect some to, to reach some plateau or some uh, utopia or, or some pipe dream or even uh, a level of peace and harmony that you don't have to be embarrassed by how sin affects your life and marriage in the, in the lives of others, rather than any of those things, how can we live with right biblical expectations? I just jotted down some, and I, I think this might be a good way to sort of launch our conference. Expectation number one that you ought to embrace every day is that you ought to expect to deal every day with the unforeseen. Expect to deal every day with the unforeseen. Say, what do you mean, Pastor? Well, it's interesting. I think that there are passages of Scripture that get ignored by us. James chapter 4 And verse 13 and following help us understand how to stay humble about what's around the corner. You know this this passage, but if you want to jot these things down for further study and uh, and look at them uh, here and there tonight, James 4, James says to, to those who might be making plans for life, come now you who say, James 4.13, today or tomorrow we'll go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. You could actually put in there and get married and make plans and have a good life and wonderful companionship and anything else you'd like to plan. Nothing sinful about planning. He doesn't chide them for making a plan, but he says, yet you don't know what your life will be like tomorrow. What is the problem in verse 13? Drawing conclusions out of an expectation. Look, and let's make a distinction here. A desire is one thing. A desire is something you can lay before the Lord, you can pray about. He might even allow you to fulfill a desire. But let's face it, if you turn a desire into an absolute expectation and then that expectation doesn't get met, what typically happens? Suddenly disappointment, discouragement, maybe even anger. Look, I desire to get across the state at the time frame that I want to get across the state. And let's not even talk about how my wife and I see time frames differently. I'm sure that happens to none of you, but you could read about that at some point in articles and things like that. But it certainly happens with my wife and I. We have a different view of how that ought to go. It's my goal and my desire to get across the state in in the manner that I've planned. If I make that a demand or... I like to use the word expectation, and it doesn't happen, I'm in trouble. 
because I have sought in my mind to control things I cannot control. I have no control over the future human free choices of everyone else on the road. And I certainly can't control the weather, the circumstances, and and anything else that might occur that is outside of my own will. This is James' point. Come now, you who say, I've made these plans. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. And here is the reality. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Wow, that that is incredibly recalibrating. Because when you think about marriage and you think about your family life, look, you can, when you read the Bible cover to cover, you go all the way back to when sin came. Every genealogy after sin came that is ever recorded by God's people at the command of God says the same thing about every generation. And they died, and they died, and they died. And you know what? It's just generation after generation. They were here for a little while, and then they were gone. And so James pulls that whole reality into this section and says, if you make a plan, go ahead and make your plan. But if it becomes an expectation and a demand, when the reality is you don't know what your life will be like tomorrow, and you're just a vapor that appears for a little while, vanishes away, you're going to have serious problems. Let's just pull that into the context of marriage. You make your plan. You thought your marriage would go this way. You thought your spouse was going to be this kind of person. You thought your kids would do this. You thought your job would go this way. You thought your house would be this. You thought your life would be this. Don't you dream about those things when you're young? Oh, man, I raised four kids, and I'm raising a whole bunch of extended family members who came to Christ and, and had no parental instruction, perhaps, and... and You know what? All those little kids came up. They all had dreams. And and man, if I let them believe what Disney tells them, you can do anything you want to do if you put your mind to it. What a joke. Do anything? No, you can't. Some kids are smarter than others. That's life. I remember when when my youngest was playing soccer, you know, he was just, oh, we were all aggressive. He's five years old. We're playing soccer. And you know how they treat that stuff in those leagues. They just don't want anybody to feel anything about losing anything. And my son, I'm like, get in there, get some goals, you know. And he's getting goals. He comes out, man, we're winning, Dad. And the coach says, oh, Aaron, we don't, we don't keep score. And I, I look at the coach, you're kidding. What do you mean? We just got a goal. Uh, we don't keep score. You know, the other kids might feel bad. <laughs> I just said to the coach, um, can I ask you a question? He said, yeah. Did you keep score when you were in school? He said, yeah. I said, did you ever lose? Were you ever on the losing team? He said, all the time. I said, did it ruin you? He said, no. I said, we keep score. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) we have dreams. But reality is you can't control the other factors. You cannot control them. If you make those things an expectation, you're in serious trouble. That is James' point here. And so what is the answer? Verse 15, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. Man, that is such an important principle to apply to how your life turns out in marriage. Ladies, men, listen. Maybe it didn't turn out the way you thought this last year. Maybe the first five years isn't what you thought. Maybe it's going along great and you're just absolutely riding this wonderful wave of the springtime of married life and you hear all these horror stories and you're thinking, oh my goodness, if we could just avoid that. You cannot. You will not. You know why? Because you're in the marriage. You're a sinner. It's coming. Pressure difficulty, tension, testing. Why? Because the Lord is going to put paideia into your life, discipline into your life to increase your virtue. He's going to squeeze with pressure and tests and things like that. And what he wants you to say is, if the Lord wills. He doesn't want you placing an expectation that there's not going to be any unforeseen dynamics that challenge your ministry relationship together, your married life. Man, to be together with another sinner 24-7 for the rest of your life means you're really going to face the challenges. And if you've been married for any length of time, you, you already know that. 
then what's the recalibration for you since you already know that? Stop going back and defaulting to this idea that something went as it should not have gone. Look, the only thing that goes as it should not go is when you know what to do and you don't do it, therefore it is sin and you bring a negative effect upon your relationship. And even then God promises to use our failures to grow us and make us like Christ. It is so liberating, so freeing to just say, if the Lord wills, my marriage will be this and that, if the Lord wills. Expect to deal every day with the unforeseen, and you will, you will liberate your heart from a set of expectations you should not have, which have become demands more than just prayer. A desire is a prayer. An expectation should not be because you don't know what your life is going to be like. You can't control everybody else and you certainly cannot control your spouse. Expectation number two. Expect to deal every day with the negative impact of the sins of your spouse. Oh yeah. <laughs> Expect to deal every day with the negative impact of your sin spouse. Uh, of the sins of your spouse. That's right. Look, 1 Corinthians 13, that great chapter on love, says that very thing, that love is patient. Why? Because people that you're married to need your patience. Love is kind. Why? Because sometimes you're going to have to make yourself spiritually useful to someone by being kind to them when they're not kind back. Love does not keep a record of wrongs. Why does Paul say that in the great chapter on love. Because you are going to be wronged. And you're going to be more godly sometimes than your spouse. And their sin is going to negatively impact you. Listen, why did you get married if you thought you could send them off to uh, a camp to deal with their sin? And, when they, and then they come back and everything's okay. I know we'd like to do that sometimes. But that is not... Marriage. Marriage is you marry one another for a lifetime and you tell that person, I am going to become like Christ. I promise to strive against my sin and work on Christ's likeness and bring to the marriage whatever God calls me to do in the marriage. And I have made a vow to live with you in a way that brings love, biblical love, to everything about your life that you also bring to the marriage its problems and its sins. I promise to be an instrument in the hand of God in your life by learning to be godly and then loving you no matter what negative impact comes into my life. You expect to deal every day with that. Every day. Marriage is, is so much driving us in the other direction because it's uncomfortable to have to deal with the effects of your spouse's sin. And sometimes our spouse uh, has a particular sin they haven't dealt with for a long, long time. Somebody was asking me the other day, you know, is it easier when you've been married 38 years? Well, what do you mean easier? I mean, we don't deal with some of the same things that we used to deal with in, in uh, less mature years. But, you know, we are sinners and we sometimes sin in more sophisticated ways now and more subtle ways. And sometimes we have sins that the testings of life back then didn't bring out. But now the testings of life are bringing them out and they're actually quite a bit more ugly than we ever imagined. And now I know why Paul can say at the end of his Christian life, I'm the chief of sinners. Because the more truth you know, and the more testing comes, the more sin you see, and the more weakness you have to work on. Look, if you make it your goal to, uh, to see your spouse change because you, you don't think you have to deal every day with the negative impact of their sins, then you have misunderstood marriage. You have a wrong expectation. 1 Corinthians 13 is that love... Um, moves in action in all those ways listed towards somebody who doesn't treat you the same way. It is biblical love. What is biblical love? It is, it is doing good to another individual without a motive for reciprocation. That's essentially the definition of agape. All kinds of different Greek words for love, but agape, that was the word. It wasn't even a word of feeling. It wasn't even a word of uh, living in the trenches like phileo, brotherly love. It wasn't even that. It was, 
It was love, the love of doing good to someone, irrespective of whether or not they ever did anything for you, were something to you. The word had such a generic sort of do good to others kind of feel. It was so other-centered. Jesus then put the ultimate illustration on the word by making his work on the cross the ultimate expression of agape, doing good to sinners at his expense though he received nothing in return from them. That was the definition of agape through the life of Christ, the work of Christ. So expect every day to deal with the the stuff that your spouse's sin brings because if you expect that somehow you're going to hope they they deal with that stuff and and it doesn't affect your life, you're going to begin to manipulate you're going to forget that, that God is doing a work in your married life through the negative impact of the sins of your spouse. And of course, the beautiful backside of that is as God grows your spouse, you receive the same patience for your sins, same gracious love coming in the other direction when the negative of your sin is brought to the relationship number three not only do we expect to deal every day with the unforeseen and expect to deal every day with the negative impact of the sins of our spouse but if you want to recalibrate your your approach to your relationship expect to face new temptations to coddle old idolatries expect to face new tests that tempt you to coddle your old idolatries. In other words, the the point here is once you have worked on an area of your sinful life, that is not the end of your work in that area. It's not the end of it. You remember in Ephesians chapter 6, just a, a key reminder here in that great battle passage that Paul gives us in the sixth chapter of Ephesians. He says in verse 12, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. This is familiar terminology to you, but just think about it for a moment. Our struggle is against rulers, powers, world forces of this darkness, spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And if you go back a little bit, verse 11, he says that the devil has schemes And it is a term that means a hierarchy of of subtleties, ways to entice and trip up, temptations that are going to come and go in new and subtle ways. So when you have had a marriage conference and you've worked on some great things and you've learned some great principles, you take them home and a year from now you see progress, don't imagine that you, you get to sort of Take your hands and drop them and let your guard down and imagine that something subtle that's even more subtle isn't coming because it is, it will eventually. You say, well, can I just take a breather? Look, you, you have Christ. He's your breather. Christ is your rest. Sometimes He will make circumstances without terrible trial for a while. In some seasons, it seems like we, we came out of a trial and it's meadows and we haven't had one in a while. Other times, it seems like you are under one trial after another in a season of several years and you wonder, when, Lord, am I going to be able to take a breath? You know what he's saying to you during those times? I am your breath. I am your oxygen. Right? That's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12. When I am weak, then I am what? Strong. Why? In what way am I strong when I'm weak? Because even in the tests and throes of new battles and new temptations, Christ is doing a work to wean you off of yourself and strengthen your faith muscle in trusting Him. When you trust Him and yield your will to His purposes, His Spirit floods in with supernatural strength to take another step, to go another day, to go another week, to worship for another service. His Spirit promises that. He's not stingy. But don't you imagine that once you have gained some victories, 
that there aren't more subtle temptations that could come. Again, a poignant way to say this in, in the book, What Did You Expect? Uh, Paul Tripp says there are, a few couple, there are a few couples that understand the one thing they need to understand in order for lasting change to take place in their marriage. They think their battle is with the other or they think the circumstances in which they find themselves are what need to change. But here's the reality. All of the horizontal battles are the fruit of a deeper war. The most important war, the one that needs to be won, is not the war they're having with each other or their circumstances, but a war that wages within them individually. Real change is about seeing that war gained in the glory of Christ. Later, he would say, sin turns us in on ourselves. That's right. Sin makes us shrink our lives to these narrow confines of our little self-defined world. Sin causes us to shrink our focus, our motivation, and our concern to the size of our own wants and our needs and our feelings. Sin causes us to be way, to, to give way to the, what self wants. We become self-important. What all this means is that sin is essentially anti-social. Of course. And then you begin to build an expectation around the things you're not getting and you're not realizing that it really isn't about that. Whatever you're facing from all the things you cannot control, it is what Christ is wanting to do in you. And he doesn't want you succumbing to this notion that more subtleties won't be there. Look, you want discernment about the subtleties? Then, then do not set about to manipulate people and your circumstances or your spouse and your situation. Do not set about to manipulate those things. When you manipulate those things, you lose your ability to see the subtleties that are coming. And so it's a wrong expectation that you're not going to have old idolatries coming up and sneaking up on you. You will. And... Uh, you take them to the Lord immediately when you see them. It's no surprise to you. Sometimes when we sin, we say, I can't believe I did that. And actually what you ought to be saying is, oh, I can believe it. I can believe I did that. I can believe I'm tempted in that way. That's an old idolatry that I, I knew I was able to crush in the power of the Spirit five years ago, but I knew that thing would come back in some subtle way. I know. I know my own heart, and without Jesus Christ, I would lose my salvation 10 times a day, 100 times a day, if it weren't for Him sustaining me, growing me. And I know those old things can come back. Marriage is not about the eradication of those things. Marriage is about the increase of our faith so that we might be conformed to Christ. So, that leads to a fourth expectation. Expect to need God's grace moment by moment for strength to discern truth clearly. Expect to need God's grace moment by moment for strength to discern truth clearly and to stand for the truth in humility. To stand for the truth in humility. Now what does it mean to discern truth clearly? Well, you you have ministries that you attend, churches where pastors and leaders have been gifted and called by God and given to the church. They teach you the Word of God, and they, the church culture is a robust culture of discipleship. There it is. If you want to discern the truth clearly, you, you make sure you know the truth proclaimed clearly in all of its precision. You don't get vague on those things. Just as a footnote, I have a grave concern in evangelicalism that we're talking a lot of theology, but we're not really attaching it to the precision of passages. You are, you are blessed to have teaching in your ministry that works through the scriptural passages text by text, theological uh, issue by theological issue, raised by passages, whatever the author and whatever the genre, because that's putting you into the precise way God wanted you to have the truth revealed to you by the power of His Spirit. And the more you sort of get away from the precision of texts and you just talk theology, the more you're going to be vague in your understanding of how to apply specific truth to the issues of your life. And this is, of course, Paul's, again, his motif of the armor in Ephesians 6. Look, 
you, if you want to uh, sort of parry the tempting blows of Satan, then you bring the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. You bring it to bear upon those issues of your life with specific passages. That's how you build discernment. And listen, you cannot, just because you know the Scriptures, get to the level of discernment and humility you need without actually believing those Scriptures. You say, well, I believe it. Yes, but there's only one way to know whether you truly believe a text of Scripture. Humble yieldedness to it. The only way you'll ever know if you actually believe what Jesus says or what the Word of God says is when your will is beginning to humbly yield itself to the truth of Scripture in faith. Believing that the promise of God says this is the best way to live. That this is the truth you ought to obey. These are the commands you ought to submit to. Here are the motivations that ought to drive you. This is what your worship ought to look like. This is what your love ought to, ought to act like. These are what your attitudes ought to be. When you see those scriptures and God has given them to you and promised that that's the best way to live, well then your faith goes into action. You humbly yield to it. What happens then is your mind becomes renewed to such a degree that you begin to discern the difference between good and evil. Hebrews 5, you want a passage to study, Hebrews 5, 12 and 13 say that very thing. That we learn to discern between good and evil by practice. And so don't expect that you can get up in your marriage every day and just sort of go on some kind of peaceful cruise control. We need God's grace moment by moment for the strength to discern the truth clearly and stand in it in humility. That is essential in your marriage. I think about that. I think about the battles after 38 years that my wife and I uh, still struggle with in our own life of sin and then the battles that sort of hit as we work through the issues in our married life. I think about the grace of God so desperately needed moment by moment. And I think about how many days I can get up and go to work and just go about my ministry. It's prayerless. It's self-reliant. It's self-dependent. No wonder I can't discern the truth that day. Because I haven't expected to need God's grace. Moment by moment, what is His grace? To know the truth and to yield to the truth by His Spirit and to depend upon the truth. I need that every single day. And look, if there's anything that's going to drive you to that reality, it is trouble in your life in the context of marriage. And I I mean, in counseling, couples will come in and they've got major problems in their marriage we have to talk through. But the, the first several weeks, sometimes several months, believe it or not, I have to spend my time taking their eyes off the other person and putting their eyes on the scriptures and letting it be a mirror of their own life. Man, if they came in already saying that, this counseling isn't going to last very long. They're going to be skyrocketing together. But the problem is they come in and they, they actually believe the wrong thing. They don't need God's grace moment by moment. What they need is this person to get their act together. If this person would get their act together, I would be amazing. I'd be absolutely amazing if they would get these things done. Man, if couples would begin to gain from the wisdom of other couples and disciples and pastors by already being there. No, no, I need the grace of God every day. And, and my spouse isn't the problem. I don't even know why they need to be here except that you want them here because this really is about the things I need to work on in my life. And I need to see the grace of God moment by moment every day because otherwise I can't discern the truth. Expect to need it every day your married life. You say, well, I think I already do. All right, ask the Lord to test that. Do you really? Or does he still have to wean you off self-reliance and prayerlessness and self-dependence and autonomy? I have to face that every day. In fact, I would suggest that one of the things that plagues our marriages most is that right there. That we expect to go on some sort of cruising mode each day. 
And our excuse, what's our excuse? It's busy life. The Lord is busy. It, and the kids are busy, the family's busy, marriage is busy, life is busy, jobs busy, distractions are busy, ministry's busy. It's just, it's a lot. Have you ever, have you ever wondered why God has allowed all of that, that noise that's coming at us? I mean, you can't be a hermit, right? There's, you got to be a part of an assembly of God's people, and you need God's people, and you have to stir one another up to love and good deeds, Hebrews 10, and so you can't go live in the mountains where there's no more white noise and distraction. And after all, let's suppose you could go live somewhere where there isn't all that white noise and cultural junk distracting you in the busyness of life, and maybe you're retired, maybe that's what you dream of doing. But guess what? You, you haven't gotten rid of yourself, so whatever you, little oasis you built in the mountains, you just took your own self in there, and so now you just brought sin into the mountains. So you're not really accomplishing anything, can't do that. And then I think, well, Lord, you gave us the culture you gave us, you gave us the digital world, you know? I mean, people say, yeah, I need to get rid of all that. Well, you can't get rid of all that. The train is coming into the station, life moves on, God advances us, He allows us to advance, people do smart things, they advance society, um, conveniences come and they go, and they come with, with temptations and difficulties. Did you really think God didn't give us the resources to deal with the busyness of life so that we would one day use that as an excuse for why we are prayerless and not dependent and reliant upon Him? No. He knew exactly what we needed. He knew exactly the amount of white noise and distraction we'd have to deal with as a culture, as an evangelical people. He knew exactly how much busyness would come into our lives. You will never be able to stand before Christ and say, I know I didn't work on my marriage the way I should have, but you said in your word to do that, and I didn't have time. And you know why? Because you put me in a culture that was so busy, I didn't have time to do it. It's not going to happen. You're never going to be able to say that. The Lord knew where we'd grow up, the time signature we would have on the earth, the marriage that we would have, the children we would have, the business we would have. Beloved, we have to stop acting like we are so entitled and so privileged to an easy day in life and ministry and marriage. We have to stop this entitlement thing and start serving the Lord of glory who never stopped until he spilled his blood in striving for us. He never stopped. Retirement, what is, what is retirement? I'm not talking about retiring from your job, that's fine. But what is retirement if it means for you, I'm not going to spend as much time with people, I'm not going to spend as much time in the business of life. I'm not going to spend as much time working on the things that I know I, sh I used to work on when I was younger, but I don't have the energy to work on them anymore. I'm not going to spend time working on my marriage anymore. Really? Are you kidding? You have a bigger obligation the longer you're in this. You're held more responsible because you've been given more resources over a longer period of time. And the younger marriages are coming into a far more difficult scenario. Oh, we need you. We need you. No, you can't make any of those excuses. You expect every day to need God's grace, moment by moment, for strength to discern the truth clearly and stand for the truth in humility. And that means, number five, I expect to fail because of present weaknesses. <laughs> I expect to fail. I expect to fail. I don't plan to fail, hopefully. I am promised great victories and Christ-likeness. He who began a good work in you, Philippians 1, 6, will perfect it till the day of Christ Jesus. I can work out my salvation with fear and trembling because God is at work in me, willing and working for his pleasure. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. I can do that, but I don't expect to go through a day without trouble, without difficulty, without infirmity, without weakness. I'm just going to learn to boast about what God does through the weakness, 2 Corinthians 12. I'm going to learn to boast about what He's doing through the weakness. Have you ever thought about that? Your, your infirmities are showing up, your limitations are showing up, it's embarrassing in your marriage and your spouse points them out. Have you ever thought about 
looking at your spouse and saying, you know what, I, those, those weaknesses are true of me, and yet in the strength of Christ, if you pray for me and I go back to God's word and I repent of my sins, do you know what, he's, he's going to make that weakness into an opportunity for strength. Yeah, so I will most gladly boast about the distresses of life and the difficulties of life. That could fill your home with some new encouragement. James chapter 1 says, and this will be a sixth one, expect to have your faith then tested and refined and matured. Expect to have not only a need for God's grace moment by moment and expect to fail because of present weaknesses, but expect to have your faith tested and refined and matured. By the way, James 1, 2 to 4 says that to consider it joy when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. The testing of your faith producing endurance, that phraseology is, is the, sort of the, the metallurgy terminology when they would, when they would take metal and steel and they would melt it down and then they would burn the dross and it would come to the top and they'd take the dross off so the most pure metal could come to the surface. That was terminology in the New Testament that would have been familiar to them. Uh, the testing of your faith. God never tests our faith to crush our faith. He tests it to put pressure on it so that the greatest pure faith rises to the surface and the weakness and infirmity gets starved, crushed, and eradicated or killed out of your life, as it says in Romans 13, to, to put sin to death so that your weak faith is, is set aside and the faith muscle is refined into something strong that endures. Expect to have marriage test your faith and to refine it. My wife and I have been married 38 years and, uh, man, we're testing each other's faith. And I tell it all the time, honey, I'm testing your faith here. I'm refining your faith. She always says to me, oh, you're having to learn patience to live with me. And, I mean, when we were young, we used to say it the other way, you're testing me. But you know, having been married enough years, it's, it's like, yeah, we see it. We see what the Lord is doing. We see Him refining us, growing us. There's an experience of that together. There's great joy in that. So then, I guess you could extrapolate a seventh expectation. Expect then to learn new areas of needed growth. Look, I, I don't see everything I need to see as a husband. A conference like this will help, but you're not going to get it all in one conference, nor am I the best... Uh, most eloquent person to say these things. But the Spirit of God is going to show you in the struggles of marriage areas of needed growth that you did not think you had need of. I love camping on this particular expectation because part of our problem in marriage is that we, we love the, we, we bow down to the idol of our comfort and the idea that we're perpetually in school and in a school that's going to expose our infirmities in front of our spouse and others, that we just, we just will not accept. We're, we love our comfort. We love our hiddenness. We love to make sure we never talk about the seriousness of our weaknesses or infirmities. But listen, if you do not approach marriage as though there's always a need for um, areas of maturity and Christ-likeness still yet to be reached, then, then you will distance yourself from the work of the Spirit of God in marriage, and therefore you'll distance yourself from accountability. Proverbs 18, one warns about separating yourself and seeking your own desire and quarreling against sound wisdom. So that means you'll start quarreling against sound wisdom. You'll start quarreling against the refining process. Your heart will quarrel against the Lord. You will shake your fist at Him eventually in ways that will be very, very hard for you to recover from without scars. He will chasten you and it will, it will be unnecessary scars. Expect to learn new areas of needed growth all the time in marriage. And listen, beloved, if you want to be encouraged in that, 
Every time you grow, it's a reflection of the kind grace of God. So in marriage, you can expect to experience the grace of God at new levels then. You should expect to experience the grace of God at new levels. So there are some ways to look at marriage from an expectation standpoint. You shouldn't have an expectation that there's this utopia you're going to read. You shouldn't have an expectation that most of your problems in your marriage are your spouse and not you. No, you expect to deal every day with, un with the unforeseen and you say, if the Lord wills, we'll have this or that in our life and marriage. Expect to deal every day with the negative impact of the sins of your spouse because you married a sinner and you brought your sin to the marriage relationship. What did you think marriage was going to be? What did you think it was going to be? I mean, I, I watch young couples when they're making their vows to one another and having hopefully prepared them to understand the profound nature of that moment when they're making vows, I will often say to them, look, we're here in the, in the solemn moment of making vows because we've worked on your biblical understanding of what it is you're promising to this person that stands expectantly with you. But our culture, I remind them that our culture, when it makes its vows, whatever's coming on their, out of their mouth, that is not what they mean. What they mean is, hey, you make me feel awesome when I'm with you because you, you worship the ground I walk on or you do everything that makes me feel the way I want to feel. And I'm about to give you an opportunity to do that for the rest of your life. <laughs> That's essentially what a person is doing when they stand there getting married if they do not understand this dynamic. But that is not how Christians ought to go into marriage. We marry in Christ and the grace of Christ has to go to work because we will expect to be impacted by this person's sins. And I have promised to be an instrument in the hand of God to help them become more like Christ. They have promised to do that with me. And we ought to expect then to face new temptations every day, even to coddle the old idolatries. We're not going to reach some plateau and it's going to be gone new schemes and subtleties. So we're going to need God's grace moment by moment for the strength to discern clearly. We will expect to trip up and stumble and fail because of present weakness. We know God's using that to test our faith. Therefore, we need to learn new areas of growth all the time. And we can expect then to experience the grace of God in that dynamic. I just believe that this is the best way to approach what we're going to talk about. When we dig into what it means to be a husband and what it means to be a wife according to the Scripture. And by the way, there aren't, there aren't a lot of passages on what it means to be a husband and what it means to be a wife in the Bible. So that means it didn't need to be further explained in, in detail. And, uh, and frankly, they are principles to be applied in all different scenarios. There isn't a formula. It's not some secret formula. We come to conferences to get the principles that we can take and, and ground us more theologically and worshipfully around the things that God wants us to know about Himself and our worship of Him and His worthiness. Not to get some little practical list of tricks of the trade to make things run smoother at home. That cannot be. If we expect the right things, biblical things like we've talked about, then when we talk about resolving conflict, it'll make sense. It'll make sense. And you won't come to some conference trying to write down some little, uh, you know, silver bullets, if you will, for how to answer this issue or deal with that issue. When we do a Q&A, those are fun because you can flesh out some of the principles that we'll be talking about. But, but I, 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 rather than dive into the roles and then resolving conflict at the beginning of a conference, I just... I think here you have the proper biblical grid for how you're to approach this. And so tonight, what I want you to think about is, in what ways have I expected the wrong things, unbiblical things? In what ways have I not laid before the Lord these biblical expectations and said, Lord, am I doing this? Do I have these expectations? 
to expect weakness and to expect you to work and to expect tests and trials and to expect schemes and, and to expect it for all my life in marriage. My whole married life, this will never end until Christ comes. And that doesn't relegate us to a life of struggle and, and uh, unhappiness. No, it it blesses us with the grace of Christ to make us more like Christ, which then draws our marriage together around the right definition of happiness, the right experience of happiness. The reason our evangelical churches have become so weak is because they, they have opted for a cultural definition of joy and happiness and fulfillment and then applied it to marriage and, and become grossly disappointed. I was stunned this week, not surprised that sin is like this, but again, grieved this week that an ev another evangelical leader who used to tell others about how they ought to conduct themselves in marriage is separating from his wife. You know, these guys wrote books when they were just coming out of high school, it seemed to me, but just coming out of seminary, writing books, telling other people how they ought to conduct themselves in dating and marriage relationships, and they're separating. And it wasn't so much that they were separating. I know that happens, and I know there are grave difficulties, but what, what I noticed about the announcement of it was how casually it was announced. I'm not saying they are casual in their hearts about it or that they don't grieve about it, but it wasn't spoken of as the wrong thing to do. It was spoken of as a solution to irreconcilable issues. And that's, that's the grief of it because that means they had expectations that were unbiblical. And in the unbiblical expectations and the lack of fulfillment of what they wanted, they've now concluded that the only option is to do this. And uh, suddenly God looks stingy about his power. It's a poor testimony of the Lord who promised to uh, bring us better things if we would expect the right things. It makes the power of the gospel seem uh, diminished. And, and so I think this is the right place to start to have the right calibration. What should we expect from marriage? We should expect this to be an adventure, a journey, the grace of life, the work of God's grace in us and through us. We should expect that this is gonna be no different than battling sin as a Christian. This is gonna take no less than sanctification and the more sanctified you are, the more you bring to your marriage the kinds of things that make marriage what God intended it to be. You say, what if it's only me doing it and my spouse just doesn't catch on? Hey, look, there's nothing more fulfilling than a walk with Christ that has a clear conscience. There's nothing more fulfilling than that. So even in a one-sided marriage, you bring everything that Christ wants when you are walking faithfully with Him and striving faithfully with Him. The goal isn't uh, to have the kind of life you have always dreamed of. The goal is to have the kind of service to Christ that He has always planned for you. That is the goal. And so husbands, as we talk about bringing a redeeming influence to your wife, and wives, as we talk about bringing a redeeming influence to your marriage and your home and to your husband, and then we talk about resolving conflict, all these expectations need to be your recalibration. And any unbiblical expectation that has made things very challenging for you needs to be repented of, turned from, because they're shallow and superficial and they won't accomplish the work of Christ. Bow with me for a moment. Lord, we just want to say tonight that whatever you can do in helping us understand what it means to run the race with endurance, what it means to wear the armor, what it means to discern truth from error, and what it means to consider our life a vapor and we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but 
when we make our plans and have our hopes and dreams, they are to be matters of prayer, but, but we're only to know what you expect of us. And we're not to build a framework of unbiblical expectations. We're just to expect what you've said, that we are sinners. And marriage is going to be your way of weaning us from ourselves building into us a life of faithfulness to you. And when that splashes on our marriage and our families, you have promised that you'll use it for good. Lord, we've had wrong expectations at times. We've treated our marriage like it's some sort of commodity at times or, or some sort of right to our happiness or that being married and and supplying financially or, or just being friends in a marriage, that that alone ought to be all it takes to, to experience the kind of fulfillment we always hoped and dreamed about. But Lord, none of those things represent what you tell us to expect. You tell us to expect to be conformed to your image. And that means the putting to death of sin and trusting you and to see the renewal of your spirit empowering us to obey to be righteous to find freedom joy fulfillment and happiness in marriage through the the putting to death of the old life because it has no more power over us in you and the putting on of righteous attitudes and perspectives and convictions and conduct and you will use that as you promised to make our lives and our marriages fulfilling and so we ought to face our spouse with joy and anticipation and hope and patience and love and humility and a perspective that says, oh, we expect to fail, but we expect to see your grace. When we're weak, we're strong in you. When we're at the end of our self-dependence and prayerlessness, there is the denial and death of self and the rising up of newfound supernatural grace and insight and discernment and power to make our marriages a reflection of you. Lord, please forgive us for the sin we bring to, to it, the ways we mess it up, the false expectations we hold on to, the demands we make, please forgive us. And help us to come to this, this whole wonderful grace of life that you've given us and consider it a privilege, undeserved, a great adventure of getting ourselves crucified and trusting you rather than being self-willed and pouring upon our partner a love that, that imitates your love toward us, a love that reflects such sacrifice, such grace, such kindness that, that our spouse in all their infirmities are able to see your love and see you and turn to you in greater humility. Lord, may we never be naive about what you say in your word, that, that we're up against schemes and enticements inside of us and evil outside of us. And we must, we must remember to put on the armor. We must remember to, to pray and to uh, be discerning in the truth, to learn it, and never be casual, lazy, and to let our guard down or imagine we've reached some plateau, but to wake up every day anticipating your grace, needing it moment by moment. Thank you for your great patience. I cannot fathom how you could be that patient with us. And yet your patience is inexhaustible. Your kindness and grace immeasurable. And our future in you secure and hopeful and full of truth. And so make this weekend a weekend of new and biblical expectations that become the framework and grid for our marriages. And then show us 
the fruit of that happiness and joy in our companionship with our spouse. We ask it for your glory and in your holy name. Amen. Oh, there you are. Thank you so much, Pastor Jerry, for those helpful reminders and setting the tone for the conference this weekend. Just a few reminders right now. We are going to have the Cookie Fellowship. You are invited to that. Uh, we do ask that you pick up your children uh, first, before that, and we'll allow the children's workers to join us in the fellowship. And you can pick them up, I believe, right where you, at the registration table, right where you uh, drop them off. So we do have a, one way that we'll exit. will be uh, through this door here. You'll immediately take a left to go outside, and then an immediate right, and you're going to find an office center door about halfway down. You can go back in to the hallway there and then make your way to the fellowship hall. There'll be signs. You can follow the crowd. Hopefully that crowd is from this church, and they know where they're going. Um, the reason for that zigzag going outside is we want to avoid congestion in the children's wing. Um, it would get heavily congested there if we all tried to, tried to go through there. So... And you can take the long way if you want, if you want to go out the sanctuary doors that you entered and then make your way around. I believe that is it by way of announcements. So let me pray and we'll be dismissed with, with prayer. Lord, thank you for the truth. It is a grace to be informed of the truth and reminded of these principles. And, and certainly they can be painful at times, but they are tremendously profitable. And, and we welcome them because of that. As we interact now, cause our fellowship to be in the truth and exalting the Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.